to be with you again. And whether you're joining us here in the room or whether you are online, it is great to join together in this time of praise. I think most of you probably do know me, but in case you don't, uh, as Janice said, my name is Lewis. I live in Harpenden. Uh, it's great to be back as we together acknowledge, draw closer to, and learn more about our Creator, God. Just as so many people have done in so many years before us. Psalm 148 puts it like this. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And so let's add our voices to the hymn of praise rising from the earth. We're going to sing hymn number 99. Uh, I suppose you could regard this as a classic hymn, couldn't you? All creatures of our God and King. And we're going to sing the odd verses. And of course, by that, I mean the odd numbered verses. If you're in the book, not any verses you just think are odd. So <laughs> all creatures of our God and King.
Let's continue in prayer. Let's pray. How can I not praise you, Lord of my life? For in Christ you have given me all things. In Christ you have given me hope. In Christ you have given me faith. In Christ you have given me love. In Christ you have given me peace. In Christ, you have given me sisters and brothers. In Christ, you have given me a new purpose. In Christ, you have given me forgiveness. In Christ, you have given me the Holy Spirit. In Christ, you have given me new birth. In Christ, you have given me yourself. In Christ, you have given me all things. And so I say again, how can I not praise you, Lord of my life? Amen. In December, well, sort of midway through December, I moved house um, not very far away, just down the road, actually. But even so, it was a bit of a rigmarole, getting everything into boxes, moving it across. And I'm sorry, I'm slightly ashamed to say, I'm only now finishing taking some of the things out of the boxes. And I recently found this, and I thought I'd bring it to show you. Just a black folder, it looks like. But I have had this for most of my life. Um, and this folder, I started when I was very young, and it's for my certificates. It's my certificates folder. And I mean, you know, a lot of people keep their certificates, you know, perhaps their university, um, you know, um, accolades and things like that, their education status, not me. No, this is for really important stuff. Um, look, let me show you. So I have, let's see, what can we, oh yes, my 10 meter swimming award there. Um, with a little badge as well, and you can see how I progressed, because a little bit later on, my 25 meter one. Is this bringing back memories? Yeah. Um, this one, this one is amazing, this little one here. It's dated June the 7th, 1991, and it says it was awarded to Lewis Cox for remaining silent for two hours and 45 minutes. It was... I know, you're shocked. <laughs> it was a um, sponsored silence that we did at primary school. Um, I can't remember if two hours 45 was the maximum or if I managed to get that far and then the inevitable happened. But I'm still quite proud of that. I'm not sure I could do that again. Uh, has anyone here won awards? Does anyone here keep some certificates at home? Do you want to, anyone want to shout out some awards that you've won? Anything interesting? No? You're too shy. You're a humble lot here at Hemel. You don't like to brag, do you? Well, let me ask you this. If you can think back to a time when you have won an award, how did it feel? Did you enjoy receiving an award? Has anyone been, it's like those big award ceremonies you see on has anyone ever? Has anyone here been to an award ceremony? No? For anything? You've been to an award ceremony? Yes, there's a few here. Yeah, it's amazing, award ceremonies. Um, is it the highlight, I suppose, is the big thank you speeches at the end? Did, any, did you win an award at an award ceremony, or did you just, you were just there to watch it? So you saw everyone get up and receive their awards, and did they do a thank you speech? Did they do a thank you speech once they had their award? It was a decree ceremony. Oh, so probably, <laughs> probably not. But I always love it, you know, when you watch the Oscars and they come up, and... They can go on. Medals for bravery in the police. Yeah, very proud. Did he get to do a speech or did he just... No, no speeches. Perhaps that's, perhaps that's really for like the um, actors and things, isn't it? But those thank you speeches, they embellish them. I think, did one of them go on for 45 minutes one year in the Oscars? 
I think. And a lot of times it's just a list of thank yous, isn't it? I suppose they see it as a really important part of the ceremony um, to acknowledge that it wasn't just them. Uh, they didn't just win an award in their own strength. They had the support of all sorts of people to help them receive that honor. I think sometimes it's a bit like that when we have our prayers of thanksgiving uh, in church, where we say thank you to God. It's a little bit like that speech, because we say we're not where we are today because of what we've done ourselves, because of how we have behaved, but because of how Jesus has transformed our lives, has forgiven us when we have done wrong, has challenged us to do better. So we're going to spend some time uh, in, of praying in thanksgiving. Um, and let's do that now, shall we? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being there when life seemed so straightforward and so predictable. But we thank you more for your promise to hold us when times of turbulence come. Faithful God, you are present when it seems that the sun will always shine on our plans and our dreams will never end. But you also reveal yourself as the one who can be trusted, even when our lives are marked by clouds of uncertainty on every side. Sovereign Lord, we thank you for your gentle hand upon our lives and your insistent voice that calms our fears. For your peace, which all but overwhelms us, and your grace, which is sufficient for all our needs. And so for all these things, we offer you this morning our heartfelt thanks and praise. Amen. We're going to continue to give thanks in our next song. It's number 77 in the books. Give thanks to the Lord forever. And after this song, we're going to hear our reading this morning from the book of Acts. But let's stand and sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King.
Our reading for today is from Book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. Peter explains his actions. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when we, Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and when it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers who also went with me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Thank you so much. Let's pray, shall we? May the words of my mouth, may the thoughts of all our hearts and minds be guided by you, O Lord, our strength, our redeemer, and our friend. Amen. I told you earlier about some of the certificates that I received as a child, in particular the swimming ones, the uh, 15, was it the 10 meter, then the 25 meter. In truth, I'm amazed that I ever achieved those awards as a kid because it's the truth, I was terrified of the water. Ask my mum, ask my teachers, they'll tell you that when it came to swimming, I was extremely reluctant to get in the water, let alone swim unaided for any length. These sorts of challenges, these sorts of skills that we were being taught, you know, things like diving down, oh, I can remember the fear now, diving down under the water to pick something that they'd thrown onto the bottom of the pool, you know, fetch a hoop, that sort of thing. I was so nervous about it. I didn't want to do it. And more to the point, I didn't see why anyone telling me that I should do it meant that I should do it. If the whole point was that to, you throw a hoop in and I have to go down and pick it up, don't throw the hoop in. I was, a, I was, I was an awkward child. <laughs> I didn't like doing new things. I got fearful, I got nervous. I didn't like being out of my comfort zone, uh, my comfort zone being the things that I knew I could do, the things that I enjoyed doing. My friend Charlotte, who I work with in Harpenden, uh, we work in the office and often she goes to buy us lunch from the same bakery in Harpenden. And we realized just a few days ago that we don't even bother to ask each other what we want anymore because our orders are set. Charlotte has a tuna mayonnaise baguette with tomato and sweet corn. I have a prawn mayonnaise white bat with lettuce only. Thank you. I don't even like to consider changing my order because, well, what if the alternative isn't as nice? 
What if I don't like it? I'm just going to feel, oh, I wish I'd had the poor mayonnaise. Are you like that at all? How are you with new things? I know there's people um, in this world who are quite the opposite, who live for new experiences. People like my mum, who would work their way through an entire menu before they even contemplated repeating something that they'd had before. My idea of a set sandwich every day would horrify them. And anyway, I'm saying all this uh, because our reading from Acts, uh, which is very much chronicling the formation of the early Christian church, brings us an interesting story about what it means to change the way we look at things, to embrace something new. And it begs the question, do we as a church accept that new things happen, that things change Stuff doesn't always stay the same. Oh yes, I'm going there. This new idea that we heard about in Acts happens um, actually in the chapter before we started reading this morning, where Peter's at the house of a man named Cornelius. And while he's there, the unthinkable happens. There's a move of the Holy Spirit, and everyone present begins to speak in tongues, singing and praising God. And that was the astonishing thing. Everyone present was filled with the Spirit. You see, the conventional wisdom up to this point was that the Gentiles, that is, um, those who had not been circumcised as Jewish, would not be able to receive the Holy Spirit because they were not part of the chosen people of God. Everything in the religious teaching up to this point was reckoned as being valid to Jewish listeners only. Now, okay, so Jesus had made a point of saying that God's love was for the whole world, but religious leaders were somewhat wary to uh, go with this. This was, as you might imagine, a huge change for some people to accept. You might even say it was redefining their understanding of God's love. Even now, the church can have a huge problem with the idea of redefining things, expanding our understanding. We see this in the passage that we did read this morning where Peter explains his actions. And I think the fact that he has to explain them at all is revealing. Indeed, when apostles and believers heard about this movement of the Spirit, we hear that Peter was almost told off. In verse 2, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. How predictably depressing. I've worked in a church for a few years now, and it's a sad truth that often the first reaction you get when you do something new is, explain yourself. But fair enough, they're asking. And Peter goes on to recount everything that happened, that he heard the Spirit tell him not to hesitate in entering the house how he remembered the words of Jesus saying that people will be baptized not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And he thought to himself, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in their way? In other words, the Holy Spirit working through Peter proved that God's love was bigger than the definition that had been widely understood by the religious leaders of the time. It turned out that we have an epically enormous God and that we sometimes can have epically small minds. But what happens next in the passage, at the very end, uh, the last verse that we heard, once Peter has made his representations, is astonishing to me. And it's astonishing to me because as much as I would try, I'm not sure I can imagine it happening in the church today. I wonder if you remember the last verse. It says this. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. What an amazing willingness to accept a new way of thinking. 
a new way of being, a new definition of God's love that was bigger than people were used to or were willing to countenance up to that point. Why do I say I can't, imagining, I can't imagine it happening in the church today? Well, it's not because I believe that all churches are closed shops, not at all. In fact, I know that's not the case. As individual churches on the ground in local communities, I see the church working in new and innovative ways. But sometimes I take a step back and I look at the whole institution, this big, unwieldy organization, and I wonder if we can have that same response to something as we saw in our passage from Acts. The world is a changing place. It strikes me that even from the earliest verses in the book of Genesis, it was always a changing place. It was created, designed to be a changing place. But sometimes... Sometimes it feels like we're in a tug of war to keep things the same, to stop things from changing. And don't get me wrong, I do understand this. As I mentioned earlier, I am quite averse to trying new things when I would prefer to stick with what I already know. And that might well be fine for my sandwich order on a Tuesday morning. But it would be a disaster if the church of our past had made similar decisions. We'd be reading the Bible in Latin for a start. When you look back at times when the church has made big changes, like the Reformation where Martin Luther deigned to make the Bible accessible in a language that the majority of the populace could understand rather than limiting it to a small number of learned people, you always see resistance and controversy. And often the resistance comes along the lines of, well, you're just leaning into secular society. You're being led by people who aren't really Christians. Sounds a little bit similar to the arguments given by those who criticized Peter for eating with Gentiles, perhaps. The inference might be that you don't have enough faith. And if you did, you'd stand your ground. You wouldn't allow change. It's a failure of faith to change or to accept something new. And this is sad because it seems to me, at least, it can actually show an incredible amount of faith to change your mind on something to go a different way because your understanding of God's love has grown. To see and experience God's love in action through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, in so many ways, both in the Bible and in the world ever since, We've realized time and time again that God's love is greater than we previously understood. God has always proved to be more than our previous understanding. Slavery, women's rights, racism, over the years, where people thought that God's love couldn't penetrate certain situations or circumstances, we've realized through the power of the Holy Spirit that God can and God does. And you know, this really shouldn't surprise us. Jesus himself told us this is how it would work. In John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. So I just want to stress that again. Jesus told us, told you, that you would do even greater things than he did. Things will be different. Things will be new. This is just the start of it. 
our understanding of God has continued to expand. I think ultimately that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, because a simple list of what Jesus had done in and of itself wasn't enough. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will tell you what is yet to come. Change. New things. If our faith were just about following rules from a book, there'd be no need for the Holy Spirit. But it isn't, so there is. Jesus is alive. God is moving. The world is changing and we are still learning God's plan for the whole world and everyone in it. It's why we invite the Spirit into our services, into our worship, that we may have new revelation and understanding on how God can work in this world. And you know, that means accepting new things, accepting change. And no, we don't always get it right. But the important thing is to accept that challenge. So I wonder if you will accept the challenge to look at faith, at God's love differently, to do something new, to cast off the way things used to be without meaning that they were wrong, without meaning that they didn't work, but simply recognizing they were right for that time. And now by God's almighty plan, we see he is doing a new thing. I find it interesting to hear that notice earlier um, where you're following up on your um, mission day. Was it a mission day? You know, that's, um, I didn't actually know you were having that, uh, but that'll be a great opportunity to think about some of these things. In the book of Revelation, you know, that bit at the end of the Bible that often seems so weird we prefer not to go there. It should actually be something of a comfort blanket for us because it shows us what will happen in the future. The Apostle John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is shown the future, our future. And just like us showing someone from John's time the wondrous computer technology that we have today and then asking him to describe it for his friends, of course, he has trouble conveying it in a regular, easy-to-understand way. But the theme shines through. And I think it's summed up in Revelation chapter 21 when he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I firmly believe that the future of the world is not bleak, is not hopeless, if we can remain true to our calling to love in ever more radical ways, to embrace the new things that God is doing, that God has always done, to remember that we're called by Jesus to do even greater things than him. And just like those who quizzed Peter in our reading from Acts, be ready to acknowledge the new things that God is calling us to do, calling the church to do. A final point you'll be pleased to hear. Did you notice when Peter was asked to explain himself? He didn't get into a debate about the merits of it, 
He didn't argue why it was right or wrong. He didn't explain the theological connotations or understandings of it. He simply shared what had happened. The effect that God had had on the people he had been with. I do wonder if the church listened with as much effort to what God has done in people's lives as we do telling people in certain situations they couldn't possibly be truly experiencing God's love, sticking to the old rules, criticizing those who experience new things, we might be more receptive to what the Holy Spirit is really doing in the world around us. We might be more willing to say, yes, God is doing a new thing and I want to play my part in it. We might well see that God's love is even bigger than we have ever defined, maybe ever will be able to define, and to say like those who challenged Peter, we have no further objections. Instead, we are going to praise God for his unending love to all. I'd like to lead us in some prayers of response as we continue to think about this idea of doing new things. But before we do that, let's stand and sing the new song that um, we heard played for us earlier. Um, It's based on that passage from Revelation that I mentioned. There is a new heaven, there is a new earth. And whilst we pray, I'd like to encourage you to um, spend some time in the silences uh, and just let God put on your heart, maybe if there's a new thing, something, uh, a new thought, a new idea, and just be willing to accept that uh, in your mind, in your hearts as we pray this morning. So let's pray together.
loving God, Lord Jesus, we confess that we're not always ready to recognize that you are doing a new thing in this world. That you are doing a new thing in the lives of those we know. That you are doing a new thing even in us. We confess that far from being part of extending your kingdom, we too often try to pull back and resist change, feeling fearful of where you may lead us, wanting to know the whole plan before we will even take one step in the direction you are calling us in. Lord, for the times we have been selfish, prioritized our own comfort and security over your call, we take this time to say sorry. And we bring to mind the times when we have hurt others, perhaps by refusing to budge or by challenging and resisting change. We're sorry where we approach new situations with closed minds, already sure of the answer before we even listen to the experiences of others. Lord, forgive us our sins this morning. Help us to recognize the times that we have failed or fallen short. Give us the courage and humility to step forward in renewed faith and confidence, ready to listen to others, ready to accept new things, ready to break down barriers or resistance rather than prolong old arguments and debates. And to do all this as an act of faithfulness and boldness. A recognition that you are moving in this world, even now, even today. Lord, so much in this world seems hopeless, seems destined to failure. We see anguishing situations on our screens of war and violence, of poverty and injustice, of conflict and greed. Help us to see how not only can we be confident that you weep with us, but that through your Holy Spirit and through our actions, we can see your kingdom come in this world. And so, Lord, we take time to pray for those situations known to us where it seems that hope is lost. We pray for family and friends who need to know your comforting hand. We pray for rulers of nations, for wisdom, patience, and generosity.
We pray for those who are mourning and sad. For those who are exhausted or unwell. For those who feel lost or are searching. We pray for those whose faith has been interrupted or damaged by an unfriendly welcome by other believers. And Lord, we recognize that you very often call us to be part of the answers to our prayers. So please, place on our hearts and in our minds now the ways that we can be an answer to the prayers we have made this morning. Lord, whatever you have placed on our hearts, give us renewed strength of faith to step out into something new, the humility to see the other point of view, and the power of the Holy Spirit to share your love, grace, and mercy with all who we meet. Amen. And we bring our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples when to pray, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So as we draw our time together to a close, we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns from the book. It's a song that recognizes we are still building a church where love can dwell where all can know they are welcome. And it's a journey that we and the church are still on. But it is a journey that we are called to and that God joins us on. So let's stand and sing number 409 if you're in the book. Let us build a house where love can dwell.
final blessing. We have sung our songs, we have given praise to the Lord. We've prayed in faith and we have declared our hope. We have heard God's word and we have rejoiced in his promises. We have received his love and we have been renewed by his presence. Lord, now we leave this place knowing that your love will guide us, hold us, and empower us for all things forever. <laughs>